do you look for the living among the dead? That first century question was raised on the morning of the Feast of the First Fruits, the first Sunday following Passover. Today, as we celebrate, we call what we call as Resurrection Sunday or Easter, as it appears on our calendars, it is a question that must needs be raised. Why do you look for the living among the dead? In other words, don't come to the grave looking for Jesus' dead body, for he is risen, just as he said, Jesus lives. There are four questions, one of which every person who has ever lived since that fateful morning have given a response by their life choices one way or another. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Uh, if I were to just look around or if in a private setting ask you that question, how would you respond? Because at this season of the year in the United States of America, it's pretty obvious, you know, that there is something unique and special that is going on. Uh, every year, just about, we have new movie releases and the newspaper and the music and the TV for once gives some real credit and a lot of uh, face time to Jesus, this resurrected person. Mm -hmm. So how would you respond to that question, particularly if you were on national TV and somebody held a mic before you? Well, the first answer is from those who deny Jesus ever existed. They're called atheists. Now, there are a lot of people who are proud to refer to themselves and call themselves as atheists. I have known a handful in my day well, at least one of them, no, two of them I recall right now, called me to their bedside when they knew that it was inevitable wow. that they only had hours to live. And I remember in both cases where they asked me if I would pray for them. And in one of the two cases, they even shared a good confession and asked to be baptized at that last moment. So atheists depends on the circumstances sometimes, even though there are many who still call themselves atheists because they just deny that Jesus ever existed. He just is a figment of some writer's imagination and tradition over the years. The second answer then comes from those who join historians who sincerely believe that Jesus lived but they don't really believe that there is evidence enough to substantiate the biblical claims of who he is and what he has brought to mankind. They're the ones that we generally refer to as agnostics. And that's not a big negative term. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Being an atheist is just being honest. You know, I just don't believe there's such a person as Jesus. An agnostic is saying, well, you know, Maybe there was such a person, but there's certainly not enough evidence out there for me to believe it and to stake my life, my reputation, and my future just based upon these words. The third answer, and you know, and these get a little more complicated as you go along. The third answer is from those who joined the world in so many ways and believe that yes, Jesus died, but they believe that he is still dead, just like those who are recorded for us in Luke chapter 24, verses 9 through 12, just following where my opening verses were. Let me share those verses with you. When they came back from the tomb, they told all those things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Verse 11. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Well, the 
Bible is very candid and is very open and very realistic and very honest. Even some of the disciples who were there and saw Jesus put to death. And when it was announced to them by the ladies who had seen him risen, mm, they still had a lot of trouble believing it. In fact, they were so used to seeing people die and be buried that it was just nonsense to believe that anyone could be raised from the dead. So Jesus himself had already done so in his ministry. There are a lot of other religions around the world who allow the fact that Jesus was born, that perhaps he was even a prophet, but they would never accept Jesus as the savior of their life that took away their sins. My terminology for that group is antagonists. Again, that is not intended to be a negative term. It just explains kind of where they are in their teachings, their understanding, and what they attempt to live in their own life. They're antagonistic toward the Word of God and that it is sacred and given to us as a gift from the Almighty Creator for us to be able to understand more clearly what joy and peace and fulfillment and purpose in our lives is all about. There is a fourth answer. And this is the one that you, by being here this morning, are a part of. The fourth answer is from those who believe that Jesus lived, that he died, and that he was resurrected from the dead, just as recorded here in God's word. The world knows us, sometimes in contempt, sometimes in humor, and sometimes just in toleration. They know us as Christians. And for Christians, I have a few things that I would like to help you or encourage you to understand what it means to be identified as a Christian in contradistinction to being an atheist or an antagonist. I want you to have a grasp on what it means to be a Christian. Luke 24, verses 13 through 16, help us to get a little, a first step grasp of this. He is alive. But there are those who were kept from recognizing him. Notice this in Luke 24, 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came upon and walked along with them and listened to these words in verse 16. But they were kept from recognizing him. I know the position that many of us are in right here with our family or friends or neighbors that we have attempted to witness to with the word of God. Or maybe even some who have sat in the pews and the chairs of the churches for many, many years and still are not sure what their relationship to Jesus should be. It is because that their eyes have been kept from clearly recognizing who the Almighty One is. They have been kept from seeing now, that sounds like that's an awfully rude thing for God to be doing to somebody, doesn't it? To keep them from seeing. But let me remind you, it's not God that is doing it. It is the person themselves who have put up the barriers between what the Almighty Heavenly Father is trying to reveal to us and what we are willing to accept. 
I love the old phrase that says, what man initiates, God accentuates. If you choose to flee from God, he's not going to put up a wall for you to run into. No. Quite the contrary. He's just going to allow you to go. And as you run into that wall, you notice you're going to bounce off. And there's going to be somebody there that's going to pick you up. And it'll be Lindsay or Peggy or Joel. It'll be some of you out there who recognize that a friend or a neighbor or a loved one has ran into a wall because they wouldn't open their eyes to receive what Jesus has for them. And so God is allowed them to be kept from recognizing him. A second thing, Jesus is alive and only, listen, only by God's mercy and grace can he be recognized. Only by God's mercy and grace. Luke 24, beginning with verse 17, I'll skip around a little here. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? That's Jesus asking those disciples. They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem, and you do not know these things that have happened here in these last days? And then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have already spoken. In other words, he's saying, Hey, you guys have had the word right at your fingertips. Why is it that you didn't recognize what was going on? It had been foretold, in some cases, for over 1,500 years ahead, what was going to happen. And then when it did happen, you didn't recognize it. And that's the same thing that's going on today. We've been now told for 3,500 years what this is all about. And yet, we're still in a world that by and large doesn't accept it. So Jesus said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, <coughs> he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Listen to verse 31. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. You know what that says to me? That when mankind initiated getting closer to God, what did the Heavenly Father do? He opened their eyes. He gave them more. Do you, do you not understand as a growing Christian that you're only going to receive from God's word that which you are ready and willing to receive? The communion service, as Jesus was just describing, there is a part of that. And that's why we do it every week, is as a reminder of the fulfillment of the promises of God's perfect and holy word. Then their eyes, when they were obedient, you know, that it seemed just a little bit silly and redundant. And that's one of the things that the secular world has a problem with the churches with, is the communion service itself. Well, why do you drink that, that, that little cup of juice and, and, and that little piece of unleavened bread? I mean, what's the big deal with that? Uh, you can go down to McDonald's and for a, a dollar have a sausage biscuit and 65 cents for a senior citizen's cup of coffee. Really get some nutrition. I mean, what's that little cup of juice for? But until you experience with open eyes and receive. I wish you could have stood in that hallway Friday night as people were leaving from that service. Two or three with tears in their eyes. And several came to me 
not only then, but also this morning, to say how meaningful that particular service was for them in their walk with Christ. Folks, that's the only purpose of the church. That's the only thing that we've got to offer to this world around. As John expressed it earlier, we want to be a church of love. A place that you can feel you don't need to beat up on or chewed on when you come here. You need to be loved upon and encouraged for us to be a catalyst to help to open your eyes. To not only receive each other's love, but that is a small model of the love of Christ that we wish to share with you. There is some others if I get on the right page in my notes. Let's see. Next one. The third one for you. He is alive. And that was recognition of who Jesus was. Their eyes were now open. And now they did something with what they were given. Look at Luke 24, 33 through 35. Here's the ones that heard Jesus. And they recognized it. And finally, and, and for a person like me, it's the most of the other one. I can't help but cry when I, I just feel the love of Christ and the sacrifice that, that he has given for a scum like me and still would make something useful of every single life, no matter where it came from. And that's the way those disciples were. They had lied about Jesus in some circumstances. They ran away when they needed to stand up in his county. And yet, he loved them unconditionally because he wanted them so much through his love and that sacrifice to be with him forever. In 2433, they got up. What did they do? They got up and went at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. That's what witnessing is all about. Somebody was telling me about somebody that they were traveling with yesterday. And they just opened up the subject of, Why don't you come to church with me sometime? And the person said, Well, you know, I've been to a lot of churches and I'd just like to go to a place where I can be loved and not judged. And that's what this verse is talking about. Witness to your friends and neighbors, to everybody that you encounter. We have a lady that walks in our community. I stopped the other day and invited her for the umpteenth time to come to church. And she said, sometime I will. As I was driving in this morning, she was out walking. I drove very, very slow and went down. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> Lindsay, I don't care if it's here. I don't care where it is. But as much trouble as there are in every church that you can possibly name, and as many shortcomings as there are in the church, for whatever reason, God says to be in church, to be in a fellowship of believers. And just get in here and love and witness and encourage and serve the risen Lord. And there'll be a sense of enrichment in your life and a fulfillment that you just can't imagine. Number four, he is alive. And Jesus personally appeared to testify to the truth of the prophecies concerning his resurrection. Luke 24, 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Verse 44, he said to them again, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The reason I bring this to your attention is, is because the Bible is still full of prophecies that have not been fulfilled. It's full of a ton of prophecies that have been fulfilled as evidence 
that this thing is divinely inspired by the Holy God, but it is full of prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you're going to be ready and equipped to recognize the Christ when he comes so that your eyes will not be veiled, rather that they will be wide open in your heart to reset, be receptive, is to hear his word, to share in fellowship, and to serve him with a willing and glorious heart. Number five, he is alive and lives were changed. This is the duh, this is the duh moment for us here. That when he appears, and when we accept him and believe him, when we choose to be obedient, to be baptized, and to raised to walk in that newness of life, we recognize not only that he is alive, but that a life has changed. Look at 24, Luke 24, 45 through 53. Then he, meaning Jesus, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and raise from the dead on the third day. The rest of it is right there for you. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. That's a prophecy. It's going on. We're a partial fulfillment of that prophecy. Verse 48. You, you're witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. Stay in the city, he's telling this particular group, until you've been clothed with power from on high. And when he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessed them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. I just one thing I want to say about that verse. That verse 24, 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Have you ever found yourself in this position? I read and read and I just don't understand. Now I don't raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass every single one of us that's in the room. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all do that. Well, that's the reason that there's I don't know, dozens and dozens of dozens of dozens of translations out here now that try to help us to understand what the word says. But as clearly as I know how to say it, it doesn't matter so much the English translation of the version that you're reading. The matter is the mind, heart, and spirit of the one who is reading open up the word and to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Now, please understand here, that doesn't mean that you can recite all of the kings of the Old Testament and all of the episodes of battle. Gene was reading to me as we were going to Tulsa yesterday and saying, well, who is Azarias and, you know, how come there's two different people at two different periods of time? I, that's not what I'm talking about, opening God's Word and understanding it. What I am talking about is when you open God's Word and you are reading it, and you have that aha moment that says, wow, that sounds like me. That sounds like something that God would have me to understand. And I guarantee you, any one of us can sit down and read the same chapter of the Bible, and God's going to give every one of us through His Holy Spirit a little something different out of that same chapter because every one of us are a little someplace different in our maturity or our growing up, as you will, with the Lord. And He's going to meet us at the point of need, and that's not going to come from memorizing Genesis through Revelation ought to be nice. <laughs> but what it is going to come from is a contrite heart that receives his mercy and is willing to take what God
God gives you today and use that like a great temple building block. And by the way, that's what you're called. You're called a temple of God, which means it's always being constructed. So I ask you to receive that. So what do you look, why do you look for the living among the dead? Yes, Jesus lived. Yes, Jesus died. But yes, Jesus lives again. And in his own words, Luke 24, 44. This is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, prophets, and Psalms, and then I add the New Testament that was written after his resurrection. I wrote this little poem for you. The power of the cross is in the blood of its saints. Upon the canvas of each life with that blood the spirit paints a portrait of one's resurrection. Where is your portrait now displayed? On the walls of heaven with beauty so rare? or on the walls of torment at the bottom of the stair. The way to know that heaven is your destiny is a good confession and a life testimony. And now to me as we stand and sing, I'll ask you the question that will make your heart break. <coughs> if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as that Lord of your life so that your eyes could be opened, I invite you either to come up and speak with me, I'll be standing over here, or as soon as our service is over, please speak with David myself or one of the other leaders that you recognize, or we will share with you the way to start receiving the blessings and mercies of the Father. If you need to come, please come as we stand together.